Hey everyone, it's Carter. Welcome to this episode of Making It Up, the show where I talk to writers of all backgrounds and and levels of success and and fame. And um, you know, we have a conversation, and at the end, we make up a short story together. Uh, and so today, uh, speaking of fame, I talked to um, a very well known author. I spoke to uh, Robert Degoni, who is a critically acclaimed New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and number one Amazon best selling author. Um, he's written 23 books, a um, few different series, uh, thrillers, mysteries, um, and even uh, some standalone novels as well. And his new book is The World Played Chess, um, which is um, more of a coming of age story. And, and you know, we, we talked a lot about kind of the roots of that, and it had to do with him as an 18 year old. Um, working alongside a couple um, Vietnam vets, you know, 29 year old Vietnam vets, this is back in 79, and just hearing some of their stories and just realizing how, how, you know, the, these pivotal events, in this case, the Vietnam War, just completely changed who these people were. And that just always stuck with him. Um, you know, he, he has an interesting background. He was a uh, a journalist for quite some time and then and then a lawyer for quite some time and then just kind of had this sense of like I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing and um, uh, got into writing and, and said I'm gonna write novels I want to be a storyteller so it was it was a really great conversation uh, he was a fantastic guy to talk to very interesting very revealing uh, which I always appreciate a lot of you know I just feel like he spoke a lot of truths truth. um, and at the end we made up a really creepy evocative short story based on a sentence from John Grisham's uh, Painted House. So I hope you enjoy. This is my conversation with Robert Degoni. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. You were just finishing up teaching or something like that? I did. Yeah, I was teaching a class for the Pacific Northwest Writers Association. So oh. they're having their annual conference. What was today's class on? Uh, creating plots for page turners. Oh, <laughs> you, you know a thing or two about that. So that's good. Catch, <laughs> they they talked to the right person. <laughs> hey, I, I, love the, I love the shirt. Oh, yeah, oh, man. I'll tell you, I was probably seven or eight when I got into MASH. I was just a little kid and it was, um, and I always think about it, it's such a weird show for a kid that age to watch, right? It really is, I was just gonna say. <laughs> and, and I just, because they had a laugh track, so of course you think it's funny. And then, then it's just horrifying and emotional and they're alcoholics and they're <laughs> misogynistic. And I mean, it was, but it's a really deep show. And I just, I always fell in love with that show. Yeah, I you know it, it's I had a kind of similar weird experience where I was in Los Angeles. I was writing for the LA Times, and they sent me out to the San Gabriel Valley, and I didn't know anyone. And and I I moved out to this small little office, and everybody there was, you know, in their forties at the time, and you know they weren't going to be going out for a beer or anything. So I used to go home, and I got into the show WKRP in Cincinnati. That's so funny you say that. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just watch that show religiously. I know. It, and they, I, in fact, I, I, I listened to Mark Maron's podcast and he just had Tim Reed on who played one of the DJs um, uh -huh. and he used to be part of a comedy team. But yeah, oh, I was obsessed with that show. And the other one I got really deep into was Get Smart. I just thought that was the greatest show of all time. And, I, you, know, I, and you look back at it now, none of them hold up well at all. But well, I don't know. I think, Ma I think MASH has held up incredibly well. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah. Uh, I remember the time that they had the first time when they had like they did it in black and white and there was no laugh track. And when you're a kid watching that, it's just you know, what is what is happening here? I don't know what to do with this. It's pa it's painful. It is. It is. Uh, so where are, where do you live? What area of the country? I'm in Seattle and I am happy to say that it is raining today and it is supposed to rain all weekend. And oh. uh, I'm a kid that was born and raised in California. So you wouldn't think that would be something I would say, but I'm looking out the window and I can't tell you how happy I am. I mean, the Northwest and, and the West needs rain so desperately, yeah. so badly, you know? Totally. I, hope it rain, I hope it rains in California. That's it. They're in a bad situation. I'm in, yeah, I'm in Colorado and we're still waiting for the rain and we're getting all the smoke from, from California. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, where in California did you grow up? I grew up? up in Northern California, a little town called Burlingame. Oh, I know Burlingame. Sure, my I grew up in uh, in the L.A. area, and okay. then um, I mean, I haven't been back in decades, but my folks ultimately moved out to Walnut Creek, Alamo yeah. area. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm very familiar with that. It's beautiful, beautiful country up there. Where are you at in Denver? I was just in Vail. Oh, okay. I'm just outside of Boulder. So oh, that's, that's a beautiful area. It's, it's that really is, nice. Yeah. yeah I is, haven't, uh, I've been here for about, uh, geez, 25 years now. And are, are you a skier? Did, did the skiing take you? I, I used to be, no, work took me out here and I used to ski and then you have kids and, and you know, you try to go skiing with kids and you realize what a pain in the ass is <laughs> and it's so expensive and you know, it, an hour in they're complaining and that, that just kind of killed it for me. So I'm just kind of getting back into it now that my son's like 16 and he wants to kind of, yeah. he, doesn't, he doesn't want to go away to college and be the Colorado kid who doesn't ski. <laughs> so what about you? Um, you know, I have one artificial hip and I got the other one's got to be done. So I think my skiing days are over. Yeah. Um, but my, my wife was a fantastic skier from a very young age. And so my son was a big kid. And when he was 18 months, the, the boots would fit him. Yeah. So he was on skis, he's been on skis since he was 18 months. And my wow. daughter are pretty much the same. Um, and boy, I'll tell you, they can, the two of them can ski like, you know, like you can't believe. So that's amazing. Uh, and, and, you know, we had a rule and this was the rule. If we're going skiing, you have to carry your own ski bag right on skis so <laughs> right. you would see these my daughter in particular was very small and she had this powder blue one piece suit on you know because it was easy just stick her in it and zip it up nothing else right right and she she'd be she'd be, she'd be you know six or seven years old but she'd be you know this tall and she'd be walking up the hill carrying these skis and her ski bag and people would be looking at me like oh my god what a horrible father but <laughs> <laughs> hey you gotta learn yeah. Yeah. It's all about being tough through it. Yeah. My big thing now is we're getting into mountain biking. So that's been, uh, you know, kind of eye opening for me. It's just, you know, because I used to run and I realized how much I hate running, but I love being outside. And so mountain biking is kind of solving that a little bit for me. So that's trying, true. you know, just trying to keep in shape as you get old. It's no, just, it's, it's hard. So that's hard though. I mean, mountain biking is hard. We, so when we were in Vail, my wife and I took a day and we, we got mountain bikes. We went up on the gondola, went up on the mountain. I mean, it's like being on a jackhammer coming down that thing. You know, it's like, ee, ee. it's, it's scary. Yeah. Even on the green runs, when you're coming down an actual mountain, it's, 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 you're constantly like on the brakes and yeah, yeah. It, it, it wears on your body. Yeah. I mean, it was, I was, I looked at my wife and I said, uh, you know, we could have, we could have done the same thing at home, just joined a construction crew. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. It wipes you out completely. Yeah. We did that at Keystone just the other day and it was much harder than I, <laughs> than I expected. So you're, so you're growing up in uh, Burlingame and you had, you have uh, siblings or. I have nine siblings. Oh, okay. <laughs> One of those uh, families. I, I, you know, I grew up in, uh, in, and that's really, that's the back backdrop for the world played chess is I grew up in this bucolic blue collar, little town at the time, middle class, uh, almost predominantly white. So we didn't have a lot of experience with, with people of, of, uh, you know, minorities and, and African-Americans. I mean, I just, you know, there were, there was no, there was no crime, you know, kids did paper routes, you know, throwing newspapers off their bikes. I mean, it was, it was, it was suburbia. It was, so this is like 60s, 70s, 60s and 70s. My, yeah. my, my mom would open the door and just say, go play. Right. You know, right. I mean, I didn't worry about anything. Right. Uh, and then I got uh, my senior year in high school. I graduated from high school and uh, my, my brother-in-law, I always worked. Uh, when you're one of 10 kids, you, you work. Right. So I always worked. And my brother-in-law said, you want to, there's a, I'm working on a construction crew. They need a laborer. And I, I, I took the job and I was working alongside uh, two Vietnam vets. And this was 1979. And that was the hmm. education of a lifetime, I'll tell you. It was crazy. But um, I grew up in a beautiful area. I mean, it, it, you, you can't afford to live there anymore. You know, it's no. like, like all those places now. Right. It's just ridiculous. But, um, but it, was just, it was just beautiful when I, when I grew up there. So when you were working with those vets, so they were happy to talk about their experiences? No, no. Most I was Vietnam, wondering about that because that's the yeah, yeah, that's no, not most, common. No, most Vietnam vets won't talk about it. And in fact, when I wrote the books, one of the hard things was um, I found 
two people that were willing to talk to me about it. One was a, a Marine and he was a gunny sergeant and he had, he stayed in the Marines. So he had a full career there, 40 years. So he had all this information for me. Uh, a guy named Bob Mangan. Um, I call him gunny. Great guy. He was a friend of mine to begin with, but uh, he put me in touch with three or four people and said, uh, you know, you got to talk to this guy. You got to talk to this guy. And I would put in phone calls and I wouldn't get calls back. Uh, I asked for an email. I, they just, they don't want to talk about it. But what happened with these guys was, um, especially the one guy who in the book, I call him William. Um, what would happen is we would get done with work and, and it was summer, you know, so we'd go down in the garage and they'd have a cooler and we'd start drinking a couple of beers. And um, what I say in the book, which is not, a, it's not a true story, it's, it's fiction, but, but this was something that really happened is uh, I said, I became sort of the journal that mm. he could, that he could tell his stories to because I was 18 years old. You know, I wasn't judgmental. I wasn't his friend. I wasn't his family member. Uh, I wasn't judgmental. I, I, I didn't, you know, I, all I did was listen. And right. so we'd have a couple of beers and, and slowly the stories would come out. And then over the years, I continued to work with um, the, 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 the guy, the, the contractor on, on other projects. You know, I did a lot of tile work with him. And so this was over the course of about three years where he would, he would, open up and tell me more about what he was doing over there and where he was and what it was like coming home. Uh, you know, and it just, it was, it just was a crazy, crazy time in the country's history. You know, I, 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 I didn't, obviously my publisher and I, we didn't intend the book to come out, you know, so close to the, the evacuation in Afghanistan, but um, the parallels are, 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 you know, in, incredibly similar um, right. where we had to kind of get out of a country with our, with our tails between our legs um, and probably a place we never should have been in in the first place. And so when you're listening to these guys tell you their stories, what, you know, are you particularly fascinated by it or you were just happy to be a sounding board or was it really just hitting you like, I want to know everything about this? I really became intrigued. And in fact, I have a copy of, um, of uh, the book Nam by uh, Mark, uh, I want to say Ahern but I don't think that's right. It'll come to me, but I have an original copy, uh, an original version of, of his book, which is really snippets taken from, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of Marine, uh, uh, Vietnam veterans and their experiences. And I, and that book came out in the uh, late 1970s and I, and I have a copy and I, I got the copy in the seventies. Um, hmm. it, it just, it became fascinating to me because it was, it was, it was 180 degrees from my experience. I mean, these guys were not that much older than I was. I was 18 at the time. And these guys came home. They were in their late 20s. And they're telling me that at 18 years of age, you know, they had to get on a transport and go to, you know, South, Car South Carolina to the Marine base there. And then, you know, six months later, they found themselves at a fire base in Vietnam. I mean, it was, it was just nuts. Uh, the, the, and, and it changed them uh, dramatically. Um, and so really what the, that's what the book about It's it's not a book about Vietnam. It's not a war book. It's a book. It's a coming of age book. It's those moments in all our lives where, you know, whatever that moment is, it's different for, for all of us where you suddenly realize um, I'm not a kid anymore. And uh, this is my life. It's not my parents' life anymore. I, I have to decide how I want to lead it and what I want to do with it. And uh, for so many of these guys, they, they didn't have that choice. Yeah. That choice was taken away from them. That must have, there must be like weird emotions associated with that because, you know, as an 18 year old, you're probably thinking about to a certain extent, you know, is service something that I want to do? Do I have a duty to do that because these guys did it? Um, and also just like, I don't want anything to do with that because look what, what's happened to them. But yeah. it sounds like you were trying to figure out almost a way to, to honor what happened to them. So I wonder if there's a seed that planted there about about writing. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, uh, I grew up watching movies like the dirty dozen and the guns of Navarone, right. you know, all the, uh, the, where we were the good guys and we went in and we tricked the, the Nazis and, you know, we came home and we were the heroes and we did. 
and so there was that that you know this this is my duty this is my my honor this is my job this is what i'm supposed to do you didn't we didn't get the stories about what happened when these guys came home and had ptsd because we didn't know what ptsd was i mean so many vietnam veterans suffered for years because they'd go to the va hospital and the va hospital says there's nothing physically wrong with you right we can't help you and it wasn't until the late 70s that they started to diagnose post-traumatic stress disorder and would help these guys so yeah, that was very much true. And it was a, it was really a shattering of sort of illusions for kind of the first the first vision that I got that we didn't live in a perfect country. This wasn't this wasn't we weren't, you know, the good guys and everybody else was the bad guys um, that, that we you know, this was uh, this was a moment of, of uh, a kind of a, a reckoning that we had our we had our own own problems and our own issues. And, and you know, maybe the United States wasn't always right. And I say that and I'm very proud of my country. I mean, I, I love this, my country, and I wouldn't want to live any place else in the world. But when, when you're 18 years old, you know, and I mean, you, you think that you think that we're the good guys and everybody else is the bad guys when suddenly you begin to realize, wait a minute, that's not the case. It, it's, uh, it's, like a, it's like a punch in the face. Right, for sure. Well, and then you look at you know a twenty year war, and and to your same point, what were we doing there for so long? And you know, how do we honor these people who who were there for the whole time for, for kind of for naught? Yeah. Um, that's you know, and and it's in the seventies you did start to get the first smattering of of is certainly through film, right? The the non movies that really painted it as a very blurry picture, a Deer Hunter. Yeah comes to mind apocalypse now comes to mind where it was really like you know it really showed these were just kids and poorly trained and ill-equipped and confused and scared and, and didn't volunteer to go there yeah. um so yeah. yeah that's 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 tough well, well and the other thing you know as you get a little bit older you begin to realize there has never ever been a a country that was able to conquer another country and stay there I mean, right. the British right. Empire failed, the Roman Empire failed, the uh, uh, Genghis Khan's empire failed. The breakup of the very, Soviet very, Union, yeah. Yeah, the breakup of the Soviet It's a very simple reason. And, you know, it's one of the things that, that I remember these guys saying to me is, you know, they live there. They're not going anywhere. <laughs> they, right. they can fight forever and they will fight forever. Yeah. Um, you know, we're we're sending guys over there, taking them home, sending them over, taking them home. And so, you know, they were you're right. They were going over and they were they were fighting in the bush against people that had been fighting in the bush for 20 years. Right. Right. So, you know, yeah. it, it, why we were there is you know, it, it's never it's never worked. It's never it's never never been accomplished. Where so where did the seeds for becoming a writer come from for you? My mom. Um, before my mom started having 10 kids and, uh, you know, that was a full-time job. So are uh, you one of the older kids? I'm, I'm fifth. I'm, I'm right. Fifth. <laughs> right. So I'm, hey. uh, my wife will tell you, I, I, I'd never met a microphone I didn't like, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's the kid that starved for attention. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but my, I used to get in trouble in school yeah. because I was a smart ass. I had yeah. older brothers and sisters. And so, you know, I thought I could get away with stuff and, and uh, I was I was pretty smart, and so cl classes were easy for me. I wasn't, and so my mom started handing me these books to read. I didn't know what I was reading. I just knew they were great stories. I was reading the Count of Monte Cristo and the Old hmm. Man of the Sea and of Mice and Men and the Lord of the Flies and I mean you name it. I had the Great Gatsby. I got to high school and and I got to my English class and they started handing me these books. I said I already read it. I already oh. read that one. I already read that one. So I fell in love with stories, and and I I, I can remember the moment in seventh grade when I was twelve years old. I had to give a speech on uh, slavery from the position of an abolitionist. And I got mm -hmm. stood up in front of my class to give the speech. And, and I remember thinking to myself, this is what I want to do. That, this, this is what I want to do. I want to, I want to tell stories. This is, huh. what, this is what I want to be. So and, I was really lucky. Well, <laughs> you, you were a very strange kid because yeah. first of all, you didn't have a pronounced fear of public speaking that everybody has until at least they're 30. <laughs> um, but I mean, you think about most kids, you hand those, those particular books to, there's no way they're reading those books. Yeah, and um, I thought I thought there. It's funny, you know, you say that because uh, I uh, um, I gave the book. My son one time was asking for something to read, and I said, "Have you ever read the Count of Monte Cristo?" He said, "No." I gave it to him, and I didn't hear anything from him. And you know, he'll he'll read my stuff. In fact, he's the one that really gave me the the, the idea that made the book. The world played chess, and I, I can tell you about that in a minute. But I gave him that book, the uh, the Count of Monte Cristo, 
And I didn't hear from him. And then about, you know, three months later, I said, well, did you ever finish that book? He goes, Man, I really didn't, Dad. I, I, yeah. I didn't find it all that great. I, I thought it was parts of it were kind of boring. Yeah, the language is different. The The style is, is not what a kid today is at all used yeah. to. Yeah. So, huh. Yeah, because yeah, I, I never really, I, I read all that stuff for school and I was never into reading until my twenties. Yeah. And then that's when I discovered like, Oh, there's really yeah. interesting stories out there. Yeah. And it might be sci-fi. It might be fantasy. I mean, it could be a whole host of, you just got to find that, 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 that genre that speaks to you, you know, and that works. So I, I, so I get, a, 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 people ask me, you know, do you get upset if you get a bad review? And I say, no, it doesn't mean they don't like me. It just means they, that, that wasn't the right book for them. And, and, you know, sometimes, you know, if I get somebody just saying, I really didn't like this book, I thought, you know, it wasn't that, you know, I'll, I'll click on their name to see if, and sure enough, they're, they're reading sci-fi, they're reading fantasy, you know, and, and it's just not, it's just, it doesn't float their boat, you know? Right. Right. Well, you certainly can't expect to please everybody. <laughs> We've all had our shares of really shitty reviews. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and then, so did you, did you go to school for, did you study English in school, creative writing? I studied journalism. So uh, yeah, that best, was your inroad. Yeah. I mean, probably the best advice I ever got, I got from a basketball coach in high school who basically looked at me and said, you're too short. You can't shoot and you don't play defense. <laughs> what am I going to do with you? And he's the one who said to me, you know, uh, you'll make the team, but you'll sit on the bench and you won't play. Mr. Schaefer needs somebody to run the newspaper. He says, you can really write. And I mm. said, I'm going to go talk to Mr. Schaefer. And I was in that class and I met a gentleman who was a, a college recruiter who was a journalism came, you know, talk to come. Sam Goldman became a lifetime mentor for me. Uh, I went to uh, Stanford University. I wrote for the Daily. Mm. Uh, I got out. I wrote for the LA Times. And, and that's really kind of what I thought I'd do. I thought I'd be a reporter. But I, you know, in all honesty, I chickened out, you know, because I was living in I, I was living in San Gabriel Valley you know, writing feature stories for an edition of the LA Times. I, I didn't know anybody. I didn't, I didn't have any family down there. And, you know, the office I worked in was small and mostly older people. And, and all my buddies were going to UCLA law school and they had an extra room in their apartment. And so I was like, <laughs> okay, maybe I'll go to law school. Uh, and I did. And, you know, then wow. I was on that track for a while. Well, that's, yeah, that's a very different path. And that also, <laughs> it also necessitates a lot of writing as well. And it's funny that you made you made such a monumental life decision because your buddies had an extra room available. <laughs> but you came, did you come back to journalism or you you went into writing full time after? Did you did you practice law? Uh, yeah, I did. I mean, I practiced full time. I was a partner in oh. a law firm in San Francisco for uh, 13 years, hmm. but I never lost that love of uh, the arts and creativity and so you know I was struggling really struggling because I knew this is what wasn't where I was supposed to be and um literally how did you I know did, that like what I, I, an overwhelming I, sense of yeah. I don't like this <laughs> I would literally I would literally wake up at 30 I was 30 years old I'd wake up I'd get in the shower and I'd be in tears wow I mean, to be perfectly honest I mean wow. because yeah. it was like this isn't what I expected of my life. This is what I wanted to do. And I literally, I, I had been out playing softball the night before on the firm softball team, went out for beer and pizza afterwards, drank too much beer, woke up with a hangover, was sitting at my desk in my office with this wicked hangover. And I just said, I can't do this anymore. And I turned around and I called ACT theater. And I said, do you have any classes for beginning actors? And I had done a little bit of acting, but not a lot. I mean, real, real little. They said, yeah, we do. We have a, a class for, uh, for attorneys. I said, I don't want that class, <laughs> but I, I started taking, I started taking court classes, uh, acting classes uh, huh. through ACT. And then I was so arrogant and, or stupid that I started auditioning and I started getting cast and I, I was doing equity shows in San Francisco. Hmm. So I go to work all day. And then at seven o'clock at night, I get something to eat. I do go down and I do my run and I do the show. And I was on, on Mason street, Geary theater. And I was, doing, Oh yeah. You know, yeah. and, and, and that's what really got the juices flowing again, you know, characters and character development and dialogue and, you know, all those things began to come back to me and is like, this is what I wanted to do. So I was still practicing law and I just had to kind of find my, find my way out, uh, save my money, take a sabbatical and, and give myself a shot. So that's a, that's an interesting point because, you know, a lot of people, you know, I think there's a lot of illusion around 
how successful you can become as a writer. And for most people, it's, you know, even if you're well published, it's not something you're supporting yourself on. So a lot of people do. And when I talk, it's always like, hey, don't quit your day job, figure out how you can do both. But it sounds like for you, you know, you were at a breaking point, but even just having those acting classes was enough maybe to keep you sane for a little while longer. So was it a matter of, you know, you have to look at the logic of it with a family. You're like, okay, once I have this much saved, then I can quit. Was it something like it? Was it a long process to to kind of leave that that the law firm? Yeah, no, it it really was. But the the really the thing that was sort of the 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 blessing and the breaking point was my wife, who was born and raised in Bellevue, Washington. She wanted to come home. Mm. Uh, we just had our son. He was eighteen months old. And she wanted to, she wanted to be closer to her family. And I didn't, I wasn't licensed to practice law in Washington. State. Oh yeah. Right. So I came up here and I, I literally, I wrote for three years. I just, I, I had a windowless office in pioneer square. My, <laughs> my wife called it the prison cell. It was literally like eight feet by eight feet. You know, I could put my computer in there and, you know, I used to have to suck my stomach in to get around the desk. <laughs> the floor. Um, but I, um, and I didn't, I didn't get anything after three years. I got no nibbles or nothing at all. And I, I was ready to basically, you know, take uh, take the bar exam. And then a, a friend of mine said, she, I, she worked at a law firm. She said, we need we need help. We need construction help. We need somebody to write briefs and do all this stuff. So I, I took a job three days a week working at this law firm. And that sustained me while I was writing my novels and trying to create a name for myself, like you said, and and, and get known well enough that I could I could do this full time. So what happened to the acting? Um, when I moved up to uh, up to Washington, you know, I got out of the sort of the the circle that I had created, where I could go to an audition and people would know who I was, and they say, "You, you know, you played Ar Arthur in Camelot, or you played this." And and so I came up here and I I did a I did a little bit of um, auditioning, but we had one son, and then my daughter was born, and that's just not. A a fair thing to, to ask your wife, you know, to say, well, listen, I'm going to write all day in an office and then I'm, then I'm going to be gone all night. Right. You know, you take care of the kids. And, and, and I didn't want that. I, I didn't want to be an absentee father. I, I wanted to be, in fact, that was one of the mo real motivators for getting out of law was it was so difficult that I would get up in the morning and my son would be in his crib and I'd pick him up and he and I'd have breakfast together. And then I'd go to work and I'd come home and he'd be in his crib. Right. And that's, that's just what yeah, I it's de yeah, yeah, it's depressing is what it is. Yeah. And the older you get, you realize like, oh, I really should have spent more time or, you know, so yeah. but it's funny that you, you had that kind of seminal moment uh, in class, <laughs> giving that, giving that storytelling and having that sense of this is what I want to do. And mm -hmm. it took a long time to get there. Um, but it's almost like you were destined to come back to storytelling. Uh, ultimately, but then you hone these skills, these skills in journalism research. Um, but did, when you sat down to write a novel, did you, was that the idea? I'm like, I'm going to write a novel or like, I have this story that I want to tell. And I'm not sure if it's a novel. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to tell it. Yeah, I, I see. I was, I came from the era of uh, presumed innocent with Scott Turow and then the verdict by, by um, totally John Grisham and, and then uh, um, John Lasquois. And so I was a lawyer. And, and, you know, it was like a light bulb went off in my head. It was like, oh, my God, this is my out. This is how I can get out. You know, I can I can write a, a, a legal thriller. And right. uh, and that's really what I set out to do. But um, again, arrogant or, or stupidity, uh, probably a little of both, uh, maybe a lot of the stupidity part. But I, I didn't know how to write a novel. You well, know, yeah, I, nobody does when they first do it. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it's like I finally started going to conferences. I had a good friend, uh, Michael Colopy. He's probably the premier portrait photographer in the world now. Um, you, you'll find his pictures hanging in the Vatican. I mean, all over the place. The guy's amazing. But at the time, he was sort of in the place I was at. And he told me, he said, immerse yourself in the community in which you want to be involved. So I started going to conferences and I'd be sitting at tables with people that I had just met. They'd be talking about these books that they read on story structure, on, on character development. And I'd be like, what? So I literally took a, a step back and I took about three years and, and I, I, I gave myself an MFA and I just, you know, I just taught, I have about 40 oh, blinders. Wow. And these blinders are all, you know, different tabs, you know, character development, tension, what you're trying to do and examples. And, 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 and I, I had to learn. And, yeah. and, you know, lo and behold, you know, three years after I 
initially started after I had, you know, spent years and years studying, I started to have some success. I got yeah. an agent, my first book got picked up, you know, and it was because I, I needed to learn how to write a novel. It's how do you, how do you view teaching now? Because, you know, I, I, the same way I self-taught, you know, I started picking up books on writing and, and there's, there's so much information that you can't possibly do everything that everyone's telling you how to do something. And, it, and at some point, you know, you find your voice and you just, you have hopefully an innate understanding, probably on a subconscious level uh, that you're, you're putting the story structure together in, in a cogent way and you uh, have character development. Do you think anyone could spend three years learning and then be a good writer or do you think does there have to be that innate kind of talent there underlying everything well I, I i think i think it can i think it can be both i mean um i think the people that are are really um are really great uh are people that have done a tremendous amount of studying but have an innate ability uh example is um leonardo da vinci you know leonardo da vinci was considered probably the greatest artist of our, uh, you know, in, in ever in the world. And um, he was also an incredible student. I mean, he studied and studied and studied and studied. Michelangelo studied and studied. But of course, they also had this incredibly innate ability to, to, to create art. So I think you can find people that study and study and study, and they will be very serviceable writers. Uh, the people that are the people that you'll pick up their books and you'll go, oh my God, uh, those are the people that studied and studied, but had that innate ability to evoke emotion, to uh, to create characters that will linger in people's minds, you know, for years and years and years. Uh, you know, so I, I think it's a little of both. Yeah, I, I think my personal opinion is a, is a good writer needs to have a decent amount of empathy within them so that they can really connect and then connect you to these characters and that there's there's plot but there's emotion and and that you have a, a sense of like i care about what happens to this person i don't think everyone has that ability to to create that emotion no i i i i agree with you um you know i wrote five legal thrillers uh david sloan legal thrillers and i would call them now after writing 23 novels, I'd call those five novels very serviceable novels. And I think people can pick them up and enjoy them and read them and, and, and they'll pull something from them. But it wasn't until I had that that moment, that that aha moment, and which I got, you know, sitting at um, uh, sitting at a conference in Surrey, British Columbia, uh, and and reading Stephen King book on writing. Um, My favorite. Know, how do you how do you how does a writer sitting in his office in in outside of Boulder, Colorado, touch the life of someone in in you know Tulsa, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. to the point where that person will will cry or laugh or shout out loud and and he said telepathy. Yeah, and, and <laughs> I remember you, that. Yep. Yeah, and when you read it, you you're kind of like, oh, that really helps. And, and then you you read what he means, and what he's talking about is is you are you are that character is transcending time and place. And, and, and his emotions are transcending time and place. He exists not only in Boulder, he exists everywhere. And, and the reader just has to find it within them. It's, it's writing from the heart and, and, and allowing a character to become alive and allowing that character to be real. Diana Gabaldon, while I was up at, in Surrey, British Columbia, she called it magic. It was, yeah. it was magic. She found she would go into her office and she would close the door and she would light a candle and she would wait until her characters were comfortable speaking to her. I was on an airplane one time and I was uh, I was looking for something to watch. And so I, I wrote, I watched, I think it's called The Man Who Saved Christmas or it was about Charles Dickens. And when he, when he wrote A Christmas Story, A Christmas Carol, and, and um, it was the same thing. It was, it, he had nothing, he had nothing, he had nothing. And then suddenly Scrooge came into his, his room when he was trying to write and started to talk to him. Hmm. And, and I think as a writer, you know, it's the understanding story structure and doing your work and doing all those things are important for what you said, which is it has to become almost innate so that you can focus on letting your character live, letting your character be real instead of thinking, okay, what's my character going to do next? You're not thinking of that. Your character's just living in the moment. Right.
Right. I, and when the, I, on writing is probably the greatest book about that, that I've, I've ever read. And he also had, King also had another comment in there about, you know, life just happens and life can just happen to your characters. It doesn't have to be all structured and thought out. And which was good to me because I don't, I don't plot ever. I sit because that's the joy is sitting down and, and, you know, just see, take, take me where you're going to take me today. And it might be in a good place or a bad place. And, and realizing that there's a thousand possibilities that my story could go. And this is the one that I'm taking for better, for worse. And then ultimately letting it go at the end, just being like, this is, this is the story I created. And there could have been a lot of other ones, but this is mine and I've got to let it go. Um, because that holds up a lot of people as they never, finish their book because they're so hinged on, you know, it's not perfect. And I'm like, well, it's, you're right. It's not, it never will be. And, and, and people aren't perfect. And, and I think that, I think a lot of people take joy and solace in characters because those characters aren't perfect. Right. Right. Yeah. That's the fun of the character is having f- flawed characters that are, that, that are very relatable to all of us. Yeah. As you're, and so you, and you've, you know, written, you know, a few different styles and, and now as you're, you know, yeah, on your 23rd novel, and this is more, you know, a couple coming of age stories. Are you finding yourself drawn towards one type of story or another as, as you age? You know, I sort of, I sort of write them the same way that you, you talked about, you know, you just have to kind of let the characters tell you, you know, what, what, what your story is, uh, rather than trying to tell the characters what the story is. Um, I, uh, I, I have a publisher that has just been very, um, uh, very gracious about allowing me to uh, work in different genres. Uh, I just, I love to tell stories. My reading is the same way. I mean, I, I, I read chiclet, I read romance, I read thrillers, I read mysteries, I read hmm. you know, everything. As long as it's a good story, you know, as long as there's a character that I can empathize with and, and understand and, and, and it's a good story. So um, I, you know, I, I have an, had an idea for a, a, a lawyer who, uh, who couldn't lose. And I wrote the Davis Sloan series. I had a, an idea for a, a, a female police officer uh, who's suffering from uh, uh, really PTSD and the loss of her sister. And I wrote, you know, the Tracy Crossway series and will continue to write the Tracy Crossway series. I ran into a gentleman who said I had this fascinating character in Charles Jenkins and where did I come up with him? And he, this is a guy that used to work in the CIA. And I said, well, would you be interested in helping me write a espionage story? And I wrote the three Charles Jenkins, but the, the extraordinary life of Sam Hell and, um, and the world play chess really came out of that, that childhood experience I had when my, my mother kept handing me those classic, you know, literary novels. And I always, I always thought that, that I would write, that's what I would write. I would write stories about people with lives lived, you know, it, it, how their, how their lives unfolded and developed. And, and um, so, you know, I will, I'll, I'll always write the crazy trust White series, as long as people continue to read it. Um, and where I, what I write next is, you know, I'm writing a standalone right now. That's um, is, I wouldn't call it a legal thriller, but the main character is a lawyer, a female lawyer. Um, yeah. See what happens. I mean, standalones are great. I mean, that's all I have experience with. That's all I write are standalones. But I love the idea that anything can happen. And, you know, you yeah. could, somebody can just die on this page and that's okay because they're not coming back for another book. There's right. a little, uh, there's freedom in that, I think. Yeah. Um, but, you know, series uh, series become, tend to be a lot more successful than, than standalones. But I've never had that sense of like, I want to continue this story because I'm too excited to go in some other world uh, and explore that, that area. Yeah. yeah. Um, what were you saying earlier about your son in, in inspiring uh, uh, this book? Yeah. So, you know, I, I wrote a draft of, of the world played chess and I really told the story of Vincent when he was 18 years old. And then when he was 40 and had an 18 year old son going off to school and you know, how this, this experiences were similar and what he had learned. And um, my son came to me and he said, uh, you know, dad, I don't know anything about the Vietnam war. And it sounds like it was really a pivotal moment in our in our nation's history. I don't know anything about it. I don't I don't know why William is the way he is in in the in your book because I don't know what he went through. Do you think there's a way that you could let let the reader know, like people like me know what what he went through? Like I was thinking about a journal. I mean, maybe he kept a journal. Mm. And I went, wow, that's pretty poignant, and that's pretty smart. 
And so then I, I had a good, you know, six months of research where I was talking to people, reading firsthand accounts, watching movies, watching documentaries, you know, doing all that stuff. So I could, I could really create William. And, and that was what really elevated the story because William became more than a character. He became a, a real human being. He became a person. Right. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, we're going to do a quick storytelling and then we'll wrap up. Um, okay. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. It's always it's it's always fun. Um, I've got three books here and I'm going to have to just to choose one and we'll pick a random sentence from it. But um, speaking of writing outside their genre, John Grisham's uh, Painted House. I love this book. You know, I remember reading this and, you know, I liked all his legal thrillers for sure. But I'm like, wow, this is this is a really great writing um ali land's good me bad me which i i read a couple of years ago and loved it and uh ken follett code to zero oh wow uh let, let's go with grisham's okay and give me a page between one and 400. uh 260. Okay. sentence seven okay Pretty basic. So I'm going to read this and then you give me a sentence or two and then I'll do a sentence or two. And then uh, after a couple of minutes, I'll, I'll, I'll call it a day. Okay. He arrived in the fields sometime in the middle of the morning. As he walked through the fields, he noticed a baseball lying along the side of the grass. He picked it up, felt the weight of the ball in his hand, tossed it up and down. He turned it over in his hand and he saw a speck on the faded white leather, more than a speck, maybe three. It was clearly blood. He wiped it with his finger and it smeared just a little. It scared him. It terrified him. He began to look around on the ground and he saw another drop. It was different. The ground, the dirt was dark. He walked forward, another dirt, another drop, dark. He walked forward, two more dro drops. Now his pulse was racing. He was sweating. He didn't know whether he should go forward or turn around and run for home. The girl had been missing for three days. It was the only thing people in town were talking about. He hadn't known her that well. She had been in his fifth grade class, and he knew that people were starting to give up looking for her. He could not get over the sense that this girl was in this field somewhere. So he walked forward, curiosity pulling him more strongly than fear. He came around a bend in the field and on the other side of the rock, he saw a shoe sticking out. Not a shoe, but a slipper, a ballet slipper. He walked forward, he saw a nylon leg. He took another step forward and he could see the, the dress that she had been wearing. He didn't wanna go any further forward, but he took one more step. She was lying there, eyes open, staring at him as if waiting for him to find her. He froze, transported out of his own body. He was just looking at the scene from, from above, observing it with a detached curiosity because had he applied his own emotion, there's no way he would have been able to remain standing. He knew in the back of his mind he needed to go running back to the house, running and screaming, calling for help, calling for the police. But he just stared. And as a cloud passed over the sun and the world became a deep gray, she made a sound. <laughs> it wasn't a word, but it was definitely a sound. A gasp, a burp. He stepped forward, looked at her. Her eyes blinked once, then a second time. It scared him, but it scared him more to not know. So he took another step forward, bent to a knee, and put his fingers to her neck because he'd seen someone do that on a television show. He felt a pulse, just a slight blip. He lowered his head and could feel air coming from her mouth on his ear. She was alive. I think we'll call it there. <laughs> that was great. That was great. I think we should write that book. That that that's that's our next book. <laughs> can't you just but when you do that, can't you just totally see it all? Oh like, yeah. Like I'm like, I know exactly what this field looks like. Yeah. I know exactly when you talked about the band, I'm like, yes, I totally see all of that. Cause that's that's I, I need that almost to write. Is like I, I have to really visualize all of it and then you just write down what you see. Yeah. You know um, what I saw? I saw stand by me. 
Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. Found the boy in the train. They, oh, that, what a great movie that was. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, man, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your very busy schedule to, to, to talk to me. And I'm, I'm excited for your new book. And that's got to be a, it probably never gets old, does it? When no, comes, no, yeah. it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's nowhere near as, as exciting as the birth of your child, but it's, it's a similar feeling at least, you know, that you've, you've, you've given birth to something that hopefully will stand the test of time and, and be that one little mark on this planet that you were alive, you know, and you were here. Totally. It's right. yeah, it's transcendental. So, yeah. well, thanks Rob. I really appreciate it. And I hope you have a great, uh, great weekend. Thank you very much. And it was a pleasure being on. Take care, buddy. Bye-bye. See ya. So that was my conversation with Robert Tagoni. I had a great time talking to him. Um, that was a really engaging conversation. Um, it, I'd like to sit down with him over a cocktail and chat some more. Hopefully we'll get a chance to do that at some point. If you want to know more about Robert, you can go visit his website at robertdagonibooks.com. Again, his new book is The World Play Chess. And if you want to find out more about me, uh, just go to carterwilson.com. Uh, I would appreciate that. And check out my newsletter. Until then, uh, more episodes uh, coming out soon. And thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. T take care.